Okay, and now. Okay, thanks again, Jimmy. All right, here we go. The very last of the sessions of our overview of the book of Revelation. And um, we're looking at the chapter that we just read, chapter 16. The bowls are being poured out. So, uh, just briefly then, if we have a look, um, we have, you will notice the uh, bowls one to six, all the way down to verse 16. And then the seventh bowl is what contains the great earthquake. And this is the battle of Armageddon. The time at which Jesus Christ and the saints intervene in world affairs. And it's the time when in terms of Daniel chapter two, the little stone hits the feet on the image and grinds it to powder and the kingdom of God um, begins. So you can see how the seals and the trumpets and the bowls uh, have all been unfolded progressively throughout the last 2000 years of history. And the exciting thing the sobering thing is that when we come to look at the bowls being poured out and we look at all the events, we find that there is nothing left in the sixth bowl to be fulfilled. All we are waiting for now is the seventh bowl to be poured out. And the seventh bowl will be poured out when Jesus returns. So we are right on the edge of the return of Jesus. That's the the big takeaway uh, from uh, our series, as we will see. But first of all, let's think about uh, the first bowl. Well, the first bowl really uh, crosses over with some of the events which are hinted at in a little bit of detail, but not as much detail in chapter 11. So the first vial is this noise them sore. It's this disease that spreads. And it's speaking about the French Revolution. And uh, if we had the time, we would go into the very, very interesting history of the French Revolution and the things which caused the French Revolution. Uh, but essentially, you had for many, many years, the poor and the um, downtrodden uh, who were oppressed by the nobles and the church clergy in France. France, of course, was a very significant, significant nation state throughout this whole period of history. Uh, France was called the eldest son of the church. The relationship between the Pope and the kings of France uh, went back for centuries and centuries, all the way to the beginning of Charlemagne's empire in 800 AD. France and the Pope were like this. But the people rose up and they decided that they had had enough with the monarch the aristocracy and with the clergy and they wanted their freedom from the harsh conditions that they were living in and so we have this period of history which was called the terror well the whole french revolution lasted about 10 years but there was the particular uh time within the french revolution called the terror from april 1793 through to July 1794, when hundreds and thousands of people lost their lives at the hands of the guillotine. And the guillotine was a device um, used to inflict capital punishment on the enemies of France. If you think about what happened in uh, 
Washington, D.C. last week or a week and a half ago now. You remember when the Capitol building was stormed and the people were not successful in uh, killing many of the lawmakers and the senators uh, in the U.S. Um, power, in the U.S. Senate. Um, the French Revolution is where the people rose up and did the same thing, but they were successful. You can imagine if it had been success last week in the U.S., what a huge, what, what a huge period of instability that would have caused. But in, in France, they were successful. And they freed many prisoners from uh, the prison, the Bastille prison. They um, confiscated or stole, really, a lot of the weapons that were in the prison. And so the people now were ruling. And they put the, uh, uh, the monarch, the king, King Louis, uh, and his family to death uh, by the guillotine. Uh, and Mary Antoinette, the queen, also died. And uh, you had this extraordinary spectacle every day uh, in France for five years, where one after another, those who were the rich and the aristocracy were, were put to death by the people as enemies of freedom, enemies of France. And we really owe the modern world as it's developed and as it's grown uh, to what occurred in France. Um, this is a really interesting uh, quote here. It says, in a political sense, it is proper to date the age in which we live from the French Revolution. The shock carried by that revolution and the spread of its principles has produced repercussions ever since. They continue today whenever people claim the rights of national determination and equality before the law. Now, if you were to take the time to draw up a list of all the nations and all the states which have claimed independence and freedom to rule themselves since the French Revolution, you would be amazed. Time and time again, uh, nation states today owe their existence to the principles that were unleashed in the French Revolution. And of course, at the time, it was a very scary thing for all the monarchs throughout Europe. All the uh, royal families ruling in other parts of the empire were, were shocked and were scared because the people in France had risen up and killed the king. Uh, for some of the heads of the royal houses in Spain and Austria and Russia, they were relatives, they were related to the king of France. There were alliances formed by marriage and they could not believe that the king had been assassinated by the people. And so they rose up determined to strangle the new Republic of France. And this is what resulted in one man in particular in France becoming uh, strong and famous and the great protector of the revolution. And of course, that man's name was Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, Napoleon uh, spent the next 15 years fighting wars on behalf of France, protecting the revolution and the republic that 
they had formed. But in doing so, he also exported the principles of the revolution throughout Europe. And it's this which gradually resulted in the Holy Roman Empire coming to an end. We know Europe today as being this large group of individual nation states. They were nation states then as well, but they were confederate in a Holy Roman Empire and they had been uh, for centuries. At least they, they tried to hold it together for centuries. Napoleon smashed it. And it's only in the last 50 years that Europe has started to talk once again about being united. So this is a really um, powerful map when you think about it. This shows that the Napoleonic Empire was established in France on the foundation of the French Revolution, but it didn't stay there because Napoleon marched and sailed all throughout the western part of Europe and gradually he destroyed um, the Holy Roman Empire and the revolution came throughout the 1800s to all nations. It was only really Britain which held on to its monarchy but even today you can see that the principles of the revolution have overtaken Britain and the monarchy is just a monarch in, uh, in, in sort of, um, uh, you could say, as a, as a symbol, uh, not that they're actively ruling anymore. Um, a couple of very interesting uh, quotes about the um, revolution. Historians widely regard the revolution as one of the most important events in human history and the end of the early modern period, which started around 1500, is traditionally attributed to the onset of the French Revolution in 1789. The revolution is, in fact, often seen as marking the dawn of the modern era. Within France itself, the revolution permanently crippled the power of the aristocracy and drained the wealth of the church, although the two institutions survived despite the damage they sustained. And uh, all throughout um, Europe, as Napoleon uh, marched his troops uh, across the nations, uh, he would uh, deliver prisoners. He would deliver people who were in jail um, because of the power of the Catholic Church. And so the Catholic Church lost a huge amount of its power, its wealth, and its influence as a result of the revolution. And it opened up a, a new way of life for uh, people in, um, in the world. Thousands of men and even many women gained firsthand experience in the political arena. They talked, they read, they listened in new ways, they voted, they joined new organizations, and they marched for their political goals. Revolution became a tradition and republicanism an enduring option. Whenever you see people protesting in the streets with signs and placards, calling on the government to change this or change that, it's a reminder of what the French Revolution has given the, our modern world. It's given the voice back to the people. And this has obviously had some uh, positive uh, ramifications, but also much negative ones, because we know human nature uh, unleashed um, is not necessarily uh, a good thing. Okay, so the next few uh, bowls which are poured out relate to the campaigns and the wars which Napoleon um, embarked on to protect and to spread 
the ideas of the revolution. Um, so he uh, engaged in many, many battles in defense of the Republic of France. And then not only did he defend France, but he then advanced into the Austrian area and into Italy and, uh, and, and smashed the Austrian monarchy. It's interesting that he was also um, of mind to travel down to Egypt uh, and travel up to Britain. Um, and the French uh, Empire had a navy, but the navy was nowhere near as good as the navy that belonged to the British Empire. And so it's the, the next vial, the second vial, which relates to the sea being turned into blood. And uh, this is about the punishment that Britain inflicted on France uh, as a result of the, its revolution. Britain was very, very uh, apprehensive and scared about the ideals of the French Revolution. And so the uh, British decided to stop France from trading with other nations via the sea. And so they choked the French Navy. They caught Napoleon and his Navy down in uh, Cairo, down near Egypt, and they won many, many battles on the sea. Uh, and some of you will have heard of Lord Nelson, who died at the Battle of Trafalgar, which the British won. Um, but the result of this battle was that Napoleon's ships were completely destroyed. And so now he was landlocked. And instead of being able to travel overseas, he was restricted to the continent of Europe, which is where, of course, the beast was. It's where the Holy Roman Empire was. And it was where God wanted Napoleon to focus his battles and his attention. Now, some of you will know that... Um, uh, when um, blood is spilled, it coagulates. And I believe that that might be what's behind the symbol there where it says the sea became blood. It's not just that uh, the, um, there was many, many battles on the sea, which there was, but it's also that the sea and the trading networks got blocked up and uh, no French fleet could really manoeuvre in the sea anymore. And Napoleon was, as I said, restricted to the European continent. The third vial and the fourth vial are campaigns against the papacy and against Austria and against Russia that uh, Napoleon engaged in. He smashed Vienna, which was the seat of the beast. This was the capital of the Holy Roman Empire at this time. And Napoleon, in some incredible battles, uh, masterful in his strategy, uh, and obviously with the angels on his side, uh, was victorious time and time again and uh, reduced the power of the Austrian monarchy and the Holy Roman Empire considerably. Um, he had become the emperor by this time, and uh, he had crowned himself king of France, emperor of France. And that was quite con um, significant as well, because for many, many centuries, the king of France derived his power from the pope, from the papacy. It was the Pope that would crown the emperors of France and the kings of France. And uh, Napoleon made a point 
of being the one to crown Josephine, his wife, and also to crown himself as king. And he was saying that he did not need the Pope for his authority. Um, he was uh, above the Pope. So this was, this was new. This was a revolutionary idea. Uh, he had a campaign in Russia, which we uh, know was um, well it was successful to a point, but then it was uh, very unsuccessful in the Russian winter. And once again, he was directed back down to the region of Central Europe, which is where he was able to have his victories. And finally, he invaded Rome just like many of the other barbarians had in the past. And he took the Pope prisoner. So no French king had ever done that. He took the Pope prisoner and uh, locked him up in Toulon uh, in, in France. So those campaigns of Napoleon uh, disintegrated the Holy Roman Empire, and uh, was very, very um, instrumental in breaking down the power of the church. And the church took many years to recover from it. Now, interestingly enough, the first four or five vials are focused on the West. And now we go back to some information about the East. And that's the sixth vial. And it says that the waters were dried up. Okay. Now, um, there's a really amazing uh, comment from a man named James Bishino. And James Bishino was commenting on the sixth vial in the year 1798. So this is about the time that Napoleon is just beginning. And this man is commenting on the meaning of the sixth vial in Revelation 16. And look what he says. He says, if we are right in our conjectures respecting the pouring out of the sixth vial, the proof will be not only that it will be followed by the general coalition already noticed, but that the Ottoman Empire will be overturned the Jews restored to their own land and a time of trouble of wars and revolutions succeed as never once was since there was a nation. Now that is quite an amazing exposition of the sixth vial of revelation 16 written in 1798. Now at that time, this was the Ottoman Empire. And the reason he said that the Ottoman Empire would be overthrown was because it says in the sixth file that the river Euphrates would dry up. And he suggested that the symbol of the Euphrates River really was indicating the nation or the area where the river starts. And so he saw that the river Euphrates is a symbol of the Ottoman Empire. And he said, if the Euphrates River dries up, it means that the Ottoman Empire will gradually lose its power. Now, the Ottoman Empire at this time was all around the eastern part of the ancient Roman Empire and across the northern Africa, including Egypt, and also up over uh, in, in Greece, etc. And that was 1830 AD. That's the Ottoman Empire. In 1878, it had decreased in its land holdings. And we know that the huge significant event that came along next was the world war one 
But even before World War I, the Ottoman Empire had reduced again to this. But by the end of World War I, only about uh, five or so years later, the Ottoman Empire was now Turkey and it was restrained to this area here, which is still the modern day uh, area of Turkey. So the Ottoman Empire gradually dried up over that period of about 100, 150 years. And in World War I, you might remember that it was the British Empire which was instrumental in evicting the Ottoman Empire from the area of Israel. And that's the, uh, the British General Allenby capturing Jerusalem from the Turks in 1917. Now, you remember what uh, James Bacino said. He said, if I understand the sixth vial correctly, what it means is that once the Ottoman Empire leaves the area of Israel, it will open the way for the Jews to return to the land. And that's exactly what happened. After World War I, we know that the Zionist movement was successful, or prior even to World War I, the Zionist movement had been successful in luring some Jews back to the Holy Land to start a nation. But it was World War II that really resulted in the British opening up the way for the Jews to return to the land and uh, Hitler and the Nazi Germany is what drove many Jews to seek a homeland after the Holocaust. And so because the River Euphrates has dried all the way back up to Turkey, it opened the way for the Jews, the kings of the East, to return to the land, which they did. And so in 1948, the state of Israel was born. And uh, as you probably know, uh, recently, um, they just celebrated their 70 years in the land. Now, in Revelation uh, chapter 16, it goes on to talk about a time of great trouble, a time of um, the spirits of, of, of madness being unleashed in the world, frog-like spirits, which, which I, I believe is the, is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, and also perhaps the, the spirit of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity. And since the state of Israel has become independent, revolutions have continued across the world. In 1989, they had the year uh, of miracles. They called it Annus Mirabilis. It was the year of miracles. And it was when the Soviet Union broke up, the Berlin Wall came down, and there was many, many nation states which popped up overnight almost, having their own revolutions and becoming their own independent state. And if we see all over the world now, and over the last 20 to 30 years, we continue to see the spirit of the French Revolution rolling through. We, have, um, we had the Arab Spring about 10 years ago where um, uh, Libya, um, uh, Algiers, and Egypt, and Syria, uh, you know, all these civil wars, people rising up, people power, um, the voice of freedom, um, you know, and, and it continues to be the, the flavor of the day. Uh, everyone has their own... Um, uh, their own voice you know you have the, the everyone has a facebook and and twitter and uh, instagram and all these things it's all about um man having the ability to express himself and to be who he wants to be and 
is it producing unity or is it producing division? Well, really, it's, it's producing division. Uh, even in America, you can see America has never been more divided between um, Republicans and Democrats and Trumpists and et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And really, if you think about it again, what does Daniel's image suggest? It says that the feet are part iron and part clay. There's this attempt to combine. There's a, this attempt to maintain unity, but never an ability um, to, to really do that. There's constant division. And we now look at that principle of division has fully mapped now to the whole world. And it doesn't matter what country or what nation you look at, whether it's India or inside China or whatever, um, you will see that there is this tension, there is this division, and there is um, an inability uh, for self-governance to be truly successful. And so that brings us down to the end of the sixth vial. And uh, this is the verse which I think describes our world. It's full of demonic spirits, performing signs, going abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. And there's tension on borders everywhere. And there's more arms race happening. There's more um, uh, rush to newer and bigger weapons. Uh, China is flexing its muscles and Russia is flexing its muscles and, and, and America is saying that they're not going to be left behind and they've got the answer to every new piece of weapons technology that is produced. The world is, is, is gearing up once again for war. And that next war is going to be the Battle of Armageddon. Now, this is really interesting. Verse 15, which is one of the most famous verses in Revelation chapter 16, is actually in parenthesis. It's in brackets. It's an interruption. It's an interjection into the narrative. If you were to take verse 15 out, verse 14 would follow on perfectly to verse 16. See? Those who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for the battle of the great day of God the Almighty. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. That's the place of the battle. Verse 15 is Jesus interrupting. And he says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. So right when we see all of this happening and the nations getting ready for Armageddon is the point where Jesus says, be ready. I'm coming. Don't get caught sleeping. And so the exciting thing for us and the sobering thing for us, as I said earlier, is that this understanding of revelation, which we've reviewed over the last couple of days, leads us to conclude that the seals have been opened. The trumpets have been blown. Most of the bowls have already been poured and we are right on the edge of the last bowl being poured. And when that last bowl is poured, Jesus will already be here. And so the uh, great message for us is that there is never a better time for us to wake up, to realize that the theme of Revelation is the great battle that's been happening down through the ages between the dragon and the lamb. And the king is coming. He's coming like a thief. And he will determine whether we are following the dragon or whether we are following the lamb. 
so we need to stay awake and uh and i thank the committee for organizing this uh time together because it's opportunities like this to study together the book of revelation and other things which help us uh to prepare ourselves for the coming of the lord jesus so that's going to conclude our very brief look tonight at the trumpets and the bowls and um, Jimmy, I'm going to conclude there. Thank you.